And uh, so who, um, who's been out shopping in the last few days? Huh? Wasn't that a treat? Huh? Yeah, I tell you what, the other day, Linda, my wife, uh, called me on the phone and she was frantic. And uh, those of you who know Linda may understand that when she calls me, she normally is frantic. But, but this one, <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right, I'm in trouble. Anybody want to give me a ride home after? Um, anyway, um, she was frantic because, because Costco was out of toilet paper. You know, not only that, they were out of paper goods. So she said, go to Sam's Club, go to Sam's Club. And I realized, no, Sam's Club is not going to have it. I mean, <laughs> you know, if Costco doesn't have it, Sam's Club is not going to have it. So hopefully you found your toilet paper, you know, and, and you got well stocked up and things like that. But things are nutty. I mean, they really are. And so today I was looking forward to being able to talk about something other than the coronavirus. But really, when we get down to it, you know, when we look at this, this woman with this flow of blood that we just heard about here, um, she's actually got a few things in common with what's going on today. She really does. Now, the, the message is not on that. It's about shame to honor. But you'll see that there's, there's a few things in common there, beginning with this, that she needed to have hope. Like, we need to have hope right now. And she needed to have her hope found in, in Jesus, really, as, as do we. Now, we catch up with her in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. And um, in that gospel, what we'll see, or what we can see is, is that uh, this woman, when she meets Jesus, Jesus is actually going somewhere. He is on a journey. He's on a mission. He had um, a request that was given to him by a very honorable member of society. And this was the, the person who was heading up the, the local synagogue. And his daughter needed healing. So he was going to their house. I can imagine that as uh, this occurs and the woman with the flow of blood comes to Jesus, that you can just picture this guy just kind of standing there tapping his, his foot and saying, Jesus, have you seen the time? Have you seen it here? You know, that's the Festus I was talking about earlier, by the way. Uh, have you seen we got to get going. You know, but Jesus takes the time that needs to be done with this woman who has this flow of blood. And it says this then in verse 25. It says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now, this woman had some kind of an unnamed bleeding disorder. Scholars believe that it is a womanly bleeding issue, okay? And uh, because of that, um, it, it not only presents significant health risks to her, as her lifeblood is literally being drained away, but it also presents a social stigma for her. She is treated as an outcast, as though she were a leper in that society. Her condition made her impure. And it removed any shred of honor that she might have one, at one point in time experienced. Her impurity is considered to be transmissible by touching somebody else. It would go to someone else. If an unclean person such as this woman touches another person, that other person is considered to be unclean as well. Now, this kind of sounds like the coronavirus at this point. And uh, anyone who has contact with her by lying in her bed, sitting in her chair or touching her becomes unclean and is required to bathe and to wash the clothing. Her discharge of blood causes her to be expelled from society. Not just quarantined for 14 days, okay, but expelled from society for as long as she has the condition, which at this point in time appears as though she's going to have this condition for the rest of her life, which is rapidly uh, going to be ending because the flow of blood is increasing. So she deals with the shame of her condition alone, isolated, in silence. She suffers far more than just physically. She suffers socially and psychologically, knowing that she herself is a contaminant to the people around her. This is why she went to all those doctors. It's why she spent all of her money. Now, not only does she have the flow of blood, but now she's impoverished. 
And all of the money was for naught because now the flow of blood actually, instead of getting better, has gotten worse. It's increased. She was out of options. But just then, at just the right time, Jesus showed up. If only I touched the hem of his garment, she said, then I will be healed. Now, she wasn't the first to think of this. This wasn't novel with her. If we look at the rest of the Gospel of Mark, we can see that other people did this as well. Like in uh, Mark 6, 56, it says, And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. But what was different for this particular woman was this was that she did it in secret. You know, she didn't want anybody to know. She lived in the shadows because of her shame. She snuck up on Jesus from behind. She touched his garment, and then she hid in the crowd. Verse 30. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, "'Who touched my clothes?' The disciples can't believe this kind of a question coming from Jesus. What are you talking about, Jesus? Everybody's touching you, and they're all around you. I I can picture them kind of being like a parent driving a car with the kids in the back seat saying, He touched me! You know, and they're saying, Oh, what in the world, Jesus? Everybody's touching you. But, of course, only one person was healed who was touching him. And that one person is now paralyzed by fear, fear that she might be found out as she hides in the crowd. Then Jesus does what, he, what this woman fears the most. He calls her out. He doesn't let her hide. I mean, why in the world, would you, after all that she has suffered, would Jesus do this? Why, why in the world would he call her out? And why not just simply let the poor woman go home, enjoy her, her new health, and, and get on with life? But no, Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he calls her out. And she comes out and she tells her story and, and, and comes clean. Well, why would Jesus do this? Because Jesus didn't want to allow her to simply remain in the shadows any longer. Instead, Jesus wanted all to know that she was one who was going not, not just from uh, the disease to wellness, but he wanted them to know that she went from shame to honor, from shame to honor. She's no longer alone. Jesus knows who she is. By publicly recognizing her, Jesus is lifting her up out of the shadows and into his light. He's lifting her up out of the shame and into honor. And he's giving her the fullness of life. Jesus then says to her, woman, go in peace. He's not just simply saying goodbye. Hey, see you later. Have a great day. No, what he's saying there is he's using the the Hebrew word shalom, which I think most people who don't know Hebrew are familiar with the word shalom. And it means various things. It can mean different things. It can mean uh, things like, for example, wholeness, well-being, prosperity, security, friendship, and salvation. So what Jesus is saying is go and experience the fullness of life with honor. Go and experience salvation in your life because of Jesus. Wherever Jesus goes, he leaves behind changed lives. He leaves behind fishermen who no longer tend their nets. He leaves behind a storm that is stilled. He leaves behind a girl that is raised. He leaves behind the sick that are healed. He leaves behind a woman who experienced shame, who now experiences honor. And this series that we are in right now is all about that kind of difference that Jesus makes. Because Jesus was crucified for you, because he was raised from the dead for you, it makes a difference in life. Because wherever Jesus goes, he changes things. He changes lives. Now this woman is transformed from outcast to accepted, from shamed to honored. Now, the world that Jesus lived in was a world that we would call a honor-shame culture, a shame-honor culture. And it's far more so that way than our Western world is. In that that world, honor and shame really were the currency of the day. 
A wealthy person, for example, would not want to have wealth merely to have an accumulation of goods, but rather so that other people can look at them and give them honor. That was the purpose of it. Aristotle said that honor is the greatest of all goods after which important people strive. Honor was what, this, what, what, what was most valuable to these people, but this woman knew no honor. She only knew shame. This understanding of honor and shame is something that goes back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve you know, were first there in the Garden of Eden, they knew honor. They were the greatest of God's creation. And yet, what happened when sin came on the scene was shame also then came on the scene. And they realized they were naked and they hid, just like this, this woman hid in the crowd. But God went looking for them. He wouldn't allow them to remain in the shadows because God des desires to raise us up and bring us into His light. Now, these days we can see examples of the importance of shame and honor in cultures that are non-Western. You know, the rest of the world still operates this way. They still operate in an honor and shame kind of a culture. In Zimbabwe, if you were to go there and you were to hear the word for honor, what it means is literally this, uh, to, or excuse me, the, the word for shaming, rather. Uh, the word for shaming would mean literally this, to stomp your feet on my name or to wipe your feet on my name. If you say that word, that's what it means, to shame someone. Shame and honor are so important that in Afghanistan, a father may feel compelled to kill his child if that child dares to marry somebody who is from a lower class than the family because the honor of the family is all important. One missionary told this particular story that illustrates honor and shame in God's presence. He said this, he said, I was standing outside the church's meeting place to welcome people when a young unmarried man arrived late and came up to me. After greeting me, he whispered in my ear that he had just had sexual intercourse, but that he had not washed. Could he go into the meeting, he wondered. He did not think so, and I realized that in his mind, the problem was not the illicit sex itself, but the fact that he had not washed to ritually remove the uncleanness before approaching God. I was so bewildered that I ushered him into the meeting room after hastily telling him I would, it would be a good idea for us to talk afterwards. This provides the backdrop for the miracle that Jesus performed at the wedding in Cana, where, if you're familiar with that story, you know, Jesus tells the servants to fill up the water jars so that he can turn those water jars, the water in the jars, into wine. Well, the reason why the water jars didn't, weren't filled with water to begin with is because the guests had used the water as they, come, as they came into the wedding feast, um, and the wedding was going to be held before God, so they had to be washed. They had to have their shame washed away to stand in God's presence. They had to have their regrets washed away. They had to be clean and honorable before God. So Jesus took the water, changed it into wine, and with that, he's demonstrating that real cleanness... The, the way to change sh shame to honor, to be lifted up from that, is through him. And then when he changes it into wine, that wine represents his blood, which then is what is used to cleanse you. By his blood, we are healed. Another missionary to Arabs tells this story about his friend Muhammad, who was a young Jordanian man who was discovering the Bible. Muhammad, as he was reading it, he threw his Bible down when he read 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, where it reads this way. He, meaning God, raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. No, Muhammad said. No way. This cannot be true. A beggar is a beggar. A prince is a prince. This is garbage. In his world, it could be no different. I mean, you, you, a person who is shameful, a person who is shamed, is one who will be so forever. There's no coming out of the shadows. But thankfully for the woman, unlike Muhammad, that woman dared to hope. Dared to hope for something more. Dared to hope that there might be one who could raise her up. This woman with the flow of blood points ahead to this exchange then that takes place on a cross outside of Jerusalem, an exchange where Jesus is hanging on that cross. Now, the Romans loved 
crucifixion. They loved it not just simply because of um, it being a means of death for their criminals or because it was something that uh, was a, a great way to torture people or something like that physically, but they loved it because it shamed the one crucified in the process. Jesus, when he was hanging on that cross, that cross was posted by a busy thoroughfare just outside of Jerusalem where pilgrims were traveling on that thoroughfare and they could look at Jesus hanging on the cross as they were going to and from Jerusalem in and out of the city just outside the walls and and there was this crowd then that Jesus was publicly crucified in front of and the crucified person unlike what we see on crucifixes and things like that the crucified person would hang there naked you know to expose that person to maximum ridicule and shame we re read about it in the scripture where the people that were doing this as they were passing by would hurl insults at Jesus the criminal hanging to one side was hurling insults at Jesus. And the soldiers who were there took what was for them. By the way, those of you who did not make it to uh, the store to get your toilet paper in time, take notes. Okay, in those days what they would use instead of toilet paper was a sponge. And uh, they took the sponge that they had there for their latrine. And when Jesus said, I thirst, they filled it with wine and brought it up and pressed it against his face to show maximum shame and dishonor to this one who was most worthy of honor, the Son of God. This one, in other words, what Jesus was doing was he was taking the shame that you and I and this woman with the flow of blood know, and he was doing an exchange. He was taking your shame and his honor and giving you his honor and taking your shame on him. The cross is not just simply about exchanging your sin for his sinlessness. It's about exchanging your shame for his honor. And that's what this woman experienced as she was drawn out of those shadows. The blood of Jesus was shed also in this exchange so that his blood was shed so that her, her blood would not be shed so that your life would be shalom, salvation, wholeness. Well, these days we can see in our culture today, you know, it may not be a uh, shame, honor kind of a culture like some of these, but we still know shame and honor. Boy, we sure do. I mean, externally, what we can see uh, with, uh, with shame, for example, we can see with political correctness, shame is used as the primary weapon to uh, enforce compliance with particular behaviors. Likewise, you can see in Washington, name calling and things like that, the, the object is shame. You know, the hope is shame. And likewise, for honor, we can see how uh, athletes, celebrities are given honor. I mean, we've got award, awards programs and all these kinds of things that are on to show honor to, to, pe to people. So we know externally what shame and honor is all about. But likewise, I think we know internally what shame and honor is all about, too. There are times when out of the blue, you know, the thought might come to me. I'll remember something that, that happened maybe 30 years ago, and, uh, and uh, something maybe I said or did or whatever, and I'll think of that, and I'll think, man, what a bonehead. Why in the world did I say that? I mean, you know, where does that come from? It comes from here, from the shame, from the regrets, from the shadows, you know, where we tend to live. Instead, Jesus says, make the exchange. He took that dishonor, that shame on him to give you his honor so that you might be alongside of him ruling as kings, ruling as queens, princes, Judging the nations, experiencing the glory that is his, the Son of God, that is yours because you have come out of the shadows and into the light and trust in him. Let's pray about that. Can we pray about that? Why don't you please stand? Lord God, that, that word forgiveness can sometimes just be a word. But Lord, with honor and shame, we can see the, the reality of it, the substance of it, the texture of it that it's exchanging that shame, those regrets, those things that haunt us, keep us in the darkness, keep us in the shadows. And instead, Lord, you've taken that on yourself, the darkness, the shadows, the shame, the regrets, to the cross, Lord God, that we might know your honor. Help us to experience that honor today, Lord, by trusting in you giving you those things.
giving you our heart, ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.